Good afternoon and welcome back to the weekly market analysis for the week ending February 3rd, 2023. We are now in the month of February uh, and time is a flying by and we've got a lot of stuff to talk about this week. Um, I will uh, deviate a little bit from the norm of the last couple of weeks and talk a little bit about the macro catalysts that we had this week. A lot of big stuff. Uh, we had big earnings reports, especially from mega cap tech names uh, like Meta on Wednesday and Apple, Google, and uh, Amazon on Thursday. Uh, we had big economic releases like the non-farm payrolls report today, Friday, and also the ISM services PMIs. Um, and then obviously the big one from earlier this week was the FOMC rate decision. Uh, and then the press release and the press conference that followed. And so we're going to kind of take a look at all of that. But first, uh, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you find this channel helpful. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Mr. J. Thomason if uh, you want to see more of the analysis that I post all the time free on Twitter. Um, you can also go to my Substack and subscribe. It's BeFinanciallyFree.Substack.com. The links for my Twitter and my Substack are in the description below. Um, the, I have a weekly uh, issue that comes out free every week, um, so go ahead and check that out. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start here on the gold chart because today, uh, kind of what I'm, what I'm uh, wanting to focus on is this question of what exactly are the markets trying to price in? Um, there are a lot of narratives out there. Uh, there's a growing soft landing narrative that is slowly taking the place of the recession now narrative or recession soon narrative. But then very oddly enough, the markets are not backing up. Uh, they're not confirming each other. It's very interesting to see what's going on. And I'm starting out on the gold chart uh, because I want to address the specifically the price action of the last couple of days. Um, but maybe before we do that, let's uh, let's take a minute and review a couple of the things that have gone down. Uh, so if I were to just go check out uh, Apple, for example, um, Apple's had uh, some really interesting stuff happening the last couple of days. In general, the markets have uh, come up as a result of the, uh, obviously, the continued melt up that has been happening. You can kind of see since the start of the year, various liquidity dynamics uh, playing a role in uh, including the, the drain of the reverse repo facility, the drain of the Treasury General account. Those are those things have been very much discussed in detail on other channels, and I'm going to leave that to the experts on those. But suffice to say, we've been seeing basically up only um, in in stocks. Uh, we've been getting, I mean, we've got like we're looking at Apple here, but you could look at um, Carvana, which you know, if you go from the start of uh, the start of the year, even including today's price action, Carvana is up over 200 percent. At one time, it spiked uh, yesterday up to almost to uh, almost 330 um, percent. You've got uh, let's see, Tesla is another big one that has been coming up. Tesla, since the uh, since the start of the year, is up 75 percent. Um, so I mean, essentially, like wh whatever risk asset you want to go to, I mean, I'm going to go to Amazon. It's going to have a down day today, but essentially, risk assets are basically up in in 2023, um, and uh, and gold is no different than that. But but anyway, to go back um, to uh, Apple, just as the example, we had Apple earnings. Um, generally, earnings, uh, especially on Thursday of the big tech names, Apple, Google, Amazon, uh, ended up disappointing. However, um, in Apple's case, forward guidance uh, from Tim Cook and the team at Apple um, definitely projected some very positive things going forward. Um, but suffice to say, in general, we are seeing a, a continued trend of earnings uh, that are being downgraded. And, and in some cases, they're surprising to the upside, but in general, a lot of times coming in close to expectation. Um, and, uh, and so we had some of those going on this week. Um, if, you, if I go back to um, Amazon, obviously uh, coming off of yesterday's earnings. So uh, yesterday, price was up over 7%, and then today it was down over 8%. Um, as a result of poor earnings, so obviously on TradingView you can pick up um, uh, the earnings. They they surprised to the downside in uh, earnings per share. Um, revenue was uh, was up, but still uh, investors were a little concerned about that. So this was one set of catalysts. Um, we also had the FOMC meeting this week, which I want to spend some time talking about. Uh, and then we also had some economic data this week. So I thought what I would do 
uh, is I would uh, take a minute to go and look at a couple of uh, data points that I've been looking at these days. So this is uh, monthly GDP indices, um, nominal and real. Um, you can find this from S&P Global Online um, and you can download their spreadsheet and you can take some of this data. And what I'm trying to do is trying to uh, show you the pre-COVID uh, trend and I'm showing you also uh, trying to show you a uh, seasonally adjusted annualized rate on a three-month basis um, to kind of give a sense of the direction that the economy appears to be heading. Um, and one of the things, uh, and I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth between uh, some of the things on uh, on the screen um, uh, from the FOMC press conference along with some of this data. Um, so, for example, um, the rate decision on uh, from Powell on Wednesday, um, or from the FOMC on Wednesday, um, basically hiked 25 basis points. Um, and what I did want to note, too, is that uh, it, the notes say that the uh, committee anticipates that ongoing increases to the target range are going to be appropriate. Um, so I did want to highlight that specifically because I know that there were some who are thinking uh, that maybe the, the FOMC would signal a pause this week. But when you go into the press conference and you go to Powell's opening statement, um, one of the things that it talks about is that uh, reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Um, and this has been a, a, re a recurring statement, a recurring theme of the FOMC statements and Powell press conferences that they want to see sustained below trend growth over a period of time as well as a softening of labor market conditions. Um, so if we head back to our, uh, our slideshow here, um, where we've got some uh, some charts here. Uh, monthly nominal and real GDP on a three-month annualized basis uh, is kind of holding sway right around um, the uh, pre-COVID trend. Uh, so what's interesting is on a nominal basis, nominal GDP actually came down pretty substantially from the last three-month reading, um, but the real GDP uh, was actually higher, um, came in higher on a three-month annualized basis. Um, and so obviously that's not going to cut it. If we're talking about GDP, um, you know, need, if we're talking about below trend growth and needing to have it for a stain, sustained period of time, um, this is not showing you that that GDP is going to come down to that level anytime soon outside of, uh, outside of something else happening. Um, so uh, I want to, uh, again, advance a little bit and look at jobless claims because another aspect, if you uh, want to, oops, if you want to uh, look back at um, Powell's press conference, um, he mentions uh, below trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. And obviously it's not, a, it's not an attractive uh, uh, metric to look at, but uh, the best leading indicator of the payrolls report that comes out once a month on Fridays is the weekly initial and continuing jobless claims. And the point here, I know that the, the numbers look crazy because on the right side you have uh, the, the continuing jobless claims uh, up, you know, close to 2 million, um, between 1.5 to 2 million. Um, and obviously the, the bars on the other side look pretty small. But the, the point to see is that um, on both cases, I mean, the 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 light uh, purple lavender color is kind of the average jobless claims that took place over the five years before uh, 2020 during the COVID shutdowns. Um, and so these are averages. And so the average across uh, five years was approximately 245,000 um, for initial jobless claims and then just south of 2 million for continuing jobless claims. And we've just been trending down and down and down and down. And so um, it shouldn't be all that surprising then uh, to see, uh, oh, wrong slide, sorry, um, to see when you get to the non-farm payrolls data, which I have, I have two specific uh, metrics that I'm looking at here. Um, uh, but what you see here is you have the non-farm payrolls on the left side, which um, came in just sizzling hot. Um, and obviously there have been some adjustments and people are picking apart the seasonal adjustment. People are picking apart the... Um, you know, the various uh, population adjustments. Um, but the point is that, I mean, just going off of the raw data, and this is data that the Fed is going to look at, um, jobs came in way, way, way above expectation, um, sizzling hot, more than double the pre-COVID average. Um, so what I've done here is on the left side, I use the, the, the raw number. Um, so what we have is the, uh, 
uh, if you look on the screen here, the purple bar on the left uh, for non-farm payrolls establishment survey uh, is showing you essentially the, um, the average pre-COVID of um, what the non-farm payrolls did over the course of five years, like the number of jobs added per month. Um, and then we have the gray bar showing you last month, and then green is the current bar. Um, and obviously we were over 500,000 on today's report. Um, whereas the right side is a little bit different, a little bit, uh, uh, the, my, my chart up here, I, I'm still working on these charts and whatnot, but um, basically what I did on the right side with the civilian labor force is I'm calculating, because these numbers are bigger, uh, because civilian labor force and a lot of the household data tracks not necessarily the jobs added, um, but uh, the total number of employed persons. And so what I tried to do is go back and look at um, the pre-COVID average for the, the change, um, which you have to go back and you have to adjust some of the data and you have to look at it, uh, make some calculations and things like that. Um, but on average, um, the civilian labor force uh, during the five years before 2020 was uh, obviously uh, you know just north of a hundred thousand uh, jobs per month that were added in terms of civilian labor force or number of civilians working in the labor force um, and the previous month we were kind of coming in right at average um, uh, so what I do with actually the on the civilian labor force side what I do is I annualize a six-month basis because, and I don't have the other chart up, but the reason I'm explaining this is because when you look at civilian labor force and you look at it on a monthly change, raw number basis, it is very volatile. Um, so a lot of people will, you know, pick out a, a payrolls report and say, oh, well, the household data, you know, actually showed a decline in jobs. But you can have this number if you were going on a raw number of like change from the previous month, you can have this number go down 90,000 one month and then up 700,000 the next month and then down, you know, 100,000 and then up 200,000. It's very volatile. Um, and so what I've done is tried to smooth it out by getting a six month annualized average. Um, and so, uh, and even, even that is pretty volatile. Uh, so um, even that smoothing process is challenging, but suffice to say, um, you use it as a proxy. Um, I use this as a proxy because obviously the establishment data is going to be a little bit different from the household data, but even this is showing you a similar increase uh, that is fairly substantial. Um, and so, uh, again, if you want to go back to um, this idea that, you know, we need to have, uh, you know, softening labor market conditions, this is not the way, you know, and, um, to go back to uh, my slideshow here, um, if you look at some of the other payrolls data, you have private payrolls, which have increased um, on a uh, three month annualized basis. Um, private sector average hourly earnings have come down a little bit, um, but it's still well above the, uh, you know, still well above the pre-COVID trend. As you can see, the pre-COVID trend was 2.8%. Um, and on a three month annualized basis, we're coming in, you know, almost 200 basis points higher than that. Um, we saw a rebound in private sector average weekly hours um, from negative 2.3% last month's three month SAR um, to now 1.2%. Um, and then in addition, we also have private sector aggregate weekly payrolls, which, um, you know, sometimes sometimes I will replace this with, with a different uh, metric um, depending on the use. But I, I just want to show you that the average or the aggregate weekly payrolls increased um, on, uh, you know, and it's well above its pre-COVID average. So um, I just wanna point that out. So again, to return to Powell's uh, speech, uh, he made a comment of the, they need the softening of labor market conditions. And um, on a jobs basis, they're not getting it. On a, on a weekly uh, earnings, uh, on an average hourly earnings basis, they are getting it a little bit, but not nearly enough. And they're also not getting the below trend growth. Okay. So um, I know I'm taking a lot of time here at the beginning to talk about all this data, uh, but I think it's really important because, um, you know, when you go back uh, to the slideshow, um, another thing that came out uh, today was the ISM uh, data. And um, the ISM services, you can see on the right side, non-manufacturing PMI, 
uh, flipped to contraction territory. So when it's below 50, it's contraction territory. Um, we got that flip last month, but this time we jumped right back up to uh, 55.2. That, that, that change was pretty substantial. Um, and it is below uh, the pre-COVID trend, but, uh, but it, it's right up next to that. And so again, it's like now that we've gone through all that data, like the, the question that we have to continue to ask ourselves is what is it exactly that's being priced in? So to come back to the charts, um, we're going to look at gold uh, because I think gold is a really good way to understand exactly what's going on here. So gold um, has been basically on a tear for a really long time, basically even since November. It's kind of just been up only. So it turned before the other indices, uh, before the, the equity indices turned and before crypto turned and all that. And the question is why? And the reason is related to growth. So what's really interesting is that uh, we've been, some of the markets are slowly pricing in uh, Goldilocks. So like when you look at the NASDAQ being up like it is, and you look at the S&P being up like it is, and the Russell being up like it is, they're pricing in Goldilocks to perfection. So Goldilocks is uh, where growth continues to exist, like positive growth, but then you have negative inflation. Um, well, growth is bad for gold. Um, gold goes up for one of two reasons, either real rates decline or growth stagnates. Um, and so w the reason why gold has been increasing for a while is because kind of this era, if I were to kind of market this period right here, uh, was as people were fearing imminent recession. Um, in fact, again, last month uh, in January, at the beginning of January, when you got the services PMI um, in contraction, people were really, really scared of recession. And so for a long time, I've been saying this gold is being bid because of recession fear. Well, that narrative is changing because now a soft landing is more and more uh, being priced in by the markets. And so what that means in practice is that um, Gold now has to compete with the fact that growth is actually not declining, not only on a jobs basis, but also on a GDP basis and also in terms of the services PMI. So, um, so the, you know, when, when Powell, uh, when they tightened and then Powell talked about disinflation, um, a lot of people, I think, were interpreting that as, you know, like still in the context of potential recession. Um, and then obviously that position started to unwind a little yesterday. And, and I actually called on Twitter last week. I said gold was going to start correcting this week. And that was, pro that was probably the only thing I got right for this week. But nonetheless, it was right. And, uh, and then today on the jobs numbers, gold just tanked. Um, you know, and if you want to look at this on a, let me go to, uh, let me turn off a couple of things here because this is going to be all messed up otherwise. Um, so... If you look, look at gold on a one minute chart, uh, let's see here. So you can see here this huge decline that started as soon as the non-farm payrolls report was, uh, was released. Um, just a complete collapse. Um, and then when you get to the ISM uh, report, which is right about here, you can see there was another dip, bounce back, and then it basically sold down and then kind of leveled off for, for most of the day down at the levels that we're at here. Um, so uh, so my point here is uh, to highlight that um, the reason why gold is selling off is, uh, is a number of things. I suspect that obviously it's been overbought for too long on this trade, but then also growth means that gold needs to sell off. Growth means that gold is not a viable option when everything else is going to be going up um, and when inflation is not a problem. So. Um, so that's why gold is going to be going up. Uh, and then interestingly, um, a lot of people, uh, not only has the dollar uh, been, you know, kind of coming off ever since, um, basically ever since the September high, uh, coming off substantially so, um, what's really interesting is that the dollar was super bid today. And that's because, again, like people have been anticipating that the U.S. was going to go into recession and recession means weak economy. That means weak currency. 
Um, and so the people have been expecting for some time that the U.S. is going to go into recession and that the Fed was going to pivot and that the combination of those things uh, is was going to lead to further dollar weakness. So this trade, I'm not saying that the dollar is going to go back up to new highs. I mean, anything can happen. But this has been long oversold and, and has been due for a bounce for some time. Now, the question will be how much will this bounce come up? So what I'm watching actually is uh, is I'm watching to see how uh, price reacts if the dollar can hit this zone right here. Because uh, technically now the trend is strongly down. And so um, when price comes up, when the, when the DXY comes back up into kind of this zone, um, you know, like right above this, uh, this, you know, red and yellow line here, um, then what you are ultimately looking for is to see if there's continuation. So if you're a dollar bear, then this spot is the first natural spot to, uh, to, to sell. Uh, and then the next natural spot will be at this, uh, resistance line, which is only light resistance. And then the big one, if we even got that far would be up at this descending trend line. You would want to watch, uh, right there. Uh, for for that. Um, so that's kind of what I'm watching on the DXY. You do see that we are in red trend here, uh, red conditions. That means that downside bias wins. Um, and, uh, and so I just want you to be aware of that. Yields also got bid today. Um, and yields are interesting because uh, yields have been down below this uh, colorful line. Um, but they're still above trend, uh, above the long-term trend. And uh, typically, this has been a good spot to buy. You can see kind of back here in uh, late July and in early August, you see that that was a really a really solid time to to buy uh, or to sell the treasury, the ten-year treasury, because then the yield will obviously uh, go up. So what I think is really interesting is. Um, that you see price kind of just moving sideways. It's not really seeing the same kind of weakness that the dollar is seeing. Um, and we are actually getting really close to testing potentially this upside trend line. I mean, we are coming to a crossroads here where we got to test either the lower trend line or the upper trend line. Um, and so that's going to be something I am watching for um, uh, going forward. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so, so be watching yields. If yields go back up, then that's gonna be really interesting uh, for markets. Um, and then let me see, I also wanted to, let me go back to the, uh, to the S&P. Uh, the S&P is starting to trend into uh, green conditions. So when you see red, it means that the, the sell side is, is dominant or the bias needs to be to the downside. Um, and then when you get the, the green, it means that long is, is the bias. Um, and then yellow is kind of neutral in the middle. Um, so condition is, is green. You can see um, that price is well above this, uh, this, uh, this moving average. This is a, a 13 um, week moving average, uh, which is pretty good because that's kind of, it kind of tracks on a quarterly basis, 13 weeks uh, to every quarter. Um, the trend is up. It looks like we're about, I mean, we've made a, a higher low. We're making a higher high. Um, and, uh, and so that's going to be interesting to watch. The same thing on the NASDAQ, although it's much steeper and the NASDAQ hit oversold territory. You can see from that red triangle pointing down. Um, I do want to call that out. Um, I want to take a look at Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin, according to these metrics, has, I mean, Bitcoin is, is different from a lot of other things. Bitcoin can stay overbought for a very, very long time. Um, but it is really interesting to see kind of price sort of stuck right here. Um, the, the what you want to watch for a lot of people um, are looking for this to, to collapse down the fact that it hasn't for now tells you the strength that's underneath uh, Bitcoin um, so it can remain oversold for some time but what you want to be careful for is now that it has like you can see that the uh, the large red triangles have disappeared on this last candle and um, and it's not currently on the candle that's uh, just starting now for uh, Saturday's price action. Um, when price doesn't come off and that red down triangle disappears, that is a signal that it actually wants to continue back to the upside. So that's going to be something to watch on uh, on Bitcoin. And, and I previously had said that uh, on the record that I do think that uh, Bitcoin had bottomed because of the uh, my MRT uh, 
says so, says that it does. Um, because if you, let me turn off these other, uh, turn off these other items just for a moment. Uh, when price, uh, uh, for a long time, just, just so everybody knows, I was watching to see, I, I expected price to come down and cross the orange line. It did not. So because it did not, the confirmation of a, of the bottom being in historically has been when price comes above and closes above the green line. Now that doesn't mean that price can't dip back down pretty substantially, but it does mean historically that the bottom is in. Uh, and so a, a lot of people are looking for a, a nice big pullback to scale in because people were you know, watching for like 12,000 or even lower and they didn't get that. So now people are feeling pretty remorseful and regretful about not buying already. So everyone's hoping for a pullback. Um, and the question is going to be, if it does pull back, are you going to be brave and buy that spot? Um, I think the spot to buy, if there was a pullback, is going to be between 20 and 21,000. We'll see if that actually happens. That would be a, uh, that would be a perfect retest, uh, essentially, of the descending log trend line. So I'm on the, the log scale right now. Um, so you would want to see that. Um, oh, let me put that back. Uh, so that's something to watch out for. Are we going to get that retest right there? If we did, that's a spot you want to buy. Um, but obviously, because my other indicators are showing Bitcoin leaving, oops, leaving overbought territory without a significant pullback, um, you got to watch out for the possibility that this is just going to continue to to roll up and and take off. Um, so just want to call that out. And then the other thing I want to take a look at briefly is uh, crude oil. Um, crude oil ha is deeply bearish um, and will continue to be so. You can actually see there's a there's a faint gray line in the background here along with the colorful line there both pointing down. Uh, those are showing um, strong downtrend. We are in the, the red background, so um, bearish bias. Um, so I'm actually looking for price to test approximately the 65 level and that's where I'm going to be a buyer. That seems to me to be the most logical area of support. Um, as you can see, when you look back on the chart, it was resistance, resistance, and then support, support, support. Um, that's a strong area of, of horizontal support I'll be watching uh, to buy off of. Um, for what I really do believe is going to be an energy crisis, um, either later this year or next year, um, and uh, and I don't think, and I think oil is going to go higher than it did uh, this last year. So. Um, just something I want to call out, um, and in general, energy, and that's, and I, you know, I've been talking about these markets now. Markets like the equities are pricing in, and and Bitcoin is pricing in Goldilocks, and so is gold because now Goldilocks means growth, and so gold is selling off because growth is bad for gold. But what's really interesting is that energy and commodities. If I go to, uh, so I'm, we're looking at uh, crude oil futures. Crude oil is acting like recession is coming. Um, if you look at uh, the commodity index, um, commodities in general through the DBC are acting as if recession is coming. So like I said, what is the market pricing in? The market seems to be really excited in equities and, and various risk assets about the possibility of the soft landing, and they are pricing that for perfection. But commodities are pricing as if we are going into recession. And um, and in general, honestly, so are bonds. Other than the, the price action today, bonds in large part are have also been pricing in recession. It's really interesting to think about. Um, so uh, the question is, which one is going to happen? And, and I think the answer is that ultimately both. And one of them is going to happen or is happening sooner and the other one is going to happen later. Um, so obviously there's a view out there that the Goldilocks trade right now is transitory to use that term. Um, and that argument is that this price action is not going to last. A lot of people are targeting the uh, March FOMC meeting, which is happening somewhere around there uh, on the timeline. Um, for the point where this thing could actually end up rolling over. Um, if the SEP or the Summary of Economic Projections does come in showing that the Fed does indeed plan to keep to get rates to over 5% and hold them there all year. Um,
because right now, let me put this in really quick. Um, right now, the um, markets are pricing in that we're going to have rate cuts. So if you uh, go to the May meeting, right now the highest probability is that we're going to have, we're actually going to get rates, 62.6% price that we're going to get rates to uh, the level that was mentioned in the SEP. Uh, but then uh, let me go to the September meeting because the highest probability is still that we're at 500 to 525 basis points there. But then what you see is in November, you see that come down to 475 to 500. And then in December, it comes down again to 450 to 475. So the markets right now are pricing in two rate cuts uh, effectively. And so obviously something's got to give. So either the SEP in March is going to affirm that rates are going to stay at or above 5% or the SEP will change and that's going to come down. And obviously we have more economic data that's going to come. We have the CPI that's going to be uh, coming up in a, about a week and a half or so. Um, we have, uh, we're going to have a whole nother CPI and payrolls report in March before the FOMC. Um, so there's going to be a lot of potential macro catalysts for things to change. Um, but for now, um, I would be very cautious about chasing the equity rally. Um, and I would also be very cautious about trying to short this as if it were a near term top. It could be, but it also might not be. And shorting is extremely dangerous. So with that, uh, I'm going to leave that there. I apologize the video was long, but I did spend the first half of the video talking about data. So hopefully this was helpful for you and this gives you uh, a lens through which to think about what's going on in the markets today. Um, with that, uh, I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you guys next time.